I would now like to introduce to you our local speaker, Jed Goodfellow. Jed is a PH candidate within the Legal Governance Concentration of Research Excellence at Macquarie Law School. His research concerns the animal welfare regulatory framework within the Australian agricultural sector. Jed also works as a policy officer for RSPCA Australia with a focus on legislative and regulatory issues affecting animal welfare. Prior to joining Macquarie, Jed practised as a prosecutor for RSPCA South Australia and a solicitor for commercial law firm Clayton Utes. He also worked as an inspector for RSPCA Queensland during his undergraduate studies. Jed was instrumental in developing the animal law course which he is currently teaching at Macquarie University and tonight Jed will be addressing the topic regulatory capture and the welfare of farm animals in Australia. Please everybody welcome Jed Goodfellow. Thank you Ruth and uh, thank you to Voiceless for the invitation to speak tonight. I'm just going to be addressing uh, one aspect of my research at Macquarie University concerning the uh, regulatory and governance uh, systems that we have in place for uh, farm animal welfare in Australia. I think it's an important uh, topic and I think it's an important area for lawyers and researchers interested in this field to really start to engage with more because uh, at the moment we have a lot of critiquing and a lot of uh, scrutiny of the law as it stands currently or the law after it's made, uh, but we don't have enough scholarship at the moment or enough research uh, really investigating the machinery of government that is actually responsible for developing uh, the laws that we're critiquing at the moment. So I think um, to take a more proactive and practical uh, strategy for really securing uh, animal interests in the law, uh, we should really start to, to look at these areas to try and improve the processes for the development of animal welfare law in Australia. So that's the primary reason why I'm taking the approach that I am uh, at Macquarie. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to uh, some aspects of that research uh, tonight. In Australia, we have seen just over the past couple of years an unprecedented uh, un sorry, an unprecedented number of animal mistreatment cases uh, exposed within our local processing and production facilities. Uh, we also see uh, many cases involving, obviously, our live export trade as well. Um, in 2011, we, of course, had the Indonesian expose on the horrific treatment of Australian cattle in uh, Indonesian processing facilities. That triggered a level of public debate or, or public engagement with animal welfare issues never before seen in Australia's um, animal protection uh, community history. Since then, there have been several uh, further major um, incidences involving animal, animal mistreatment within the live export trade. Um, and in addition to this, we also see locally uh, many cases just over the last couple of years exposing uh, the horrific treatment of uh, animals in uh, Australian processing facilities. And these are some of the examples um, just in the last couple of years. And what we're seeing now that because of the frequency and the seriousness of these cases, uh, we're seeing an increasing number of people starting to question the adequacy of our current uh, governance and regulatory arrangements for farm animal welfare in Australia. As you can see there too, uh, examples of our uh, uh, federal MPs questioning uh, the current arrangements. And a lot of these concerns are really based on the role of departments of agriculture and primary industries uh, in having the responsibility for regulating farm animal welfare in Australia. And that concern is really based on a concern about uh, conflicts of interest arising in their role being that their primary objective is to promote productive and profitable primary industries in Australia. And there's a concern that that uh, gives rise to a conflict of interest in their accompanying role of protecting and promoting farm animal welfare. So that's really the topic of my presentation today. We also see in animal law scholarship that these, these concerns are raised as well, but unfortunately we haven't seen a great deal of consideration or analysis of this issue besides simply um, mentioning the, the issue. So we hear often that uh, the conflict of interest is self-evident without further analysis. So 
Um, that's what I'm really looking at. Um, I think it's a problem that there isn't currently further analysis on this issue because other voices within the debate uh, don't see it the same way. So we hear um, it's become somewhat of a, a catch cry for industry representatives to essentially assert precisely the opposite claim, that there's no uh, conflict of interest, there's no conflict um, between animal welfare and productivity um, because animal welfare and productivity actually go hand in hand. So it's, I think it's very important to have a, a proper look at these issues to determine whether or not there is actually a conflict uh, in practice and what implications uh, that inquiry has for uh, our, the legitimacy of our current governance and regulatory arrangements for farm animal welfare in Australia. But in order to provide some degree of uh, conceptual structure to the analysis, it's necessary to locate the inquiry within a, an established theoretical framework, and that's where the concept of regulatory capture comes in. Uh, regulatory capture is a concept that's closely associated with conflicting interests and, uh, and uh, regulatory bias, so it does provide a very uh, insightful frame of reference for analysing these issues. And I know you're not, not here to learn about regulatory theory, but I, I think it's necessary just to at least explain what the concept of regulatory capture is. It essentially occurs when a regulatory agency acts in the interests of the, indus the industry or the, the firm or the individual that it is regulating in a way that causes uh, that regulator to deviate from serving the public interest uh, that underpins the statute or that the regulation is designed to serve. And there are many different mechanisms that uh, cause a regulator to deviate from the public interest, uh, but the, the primary one that I want to focus on tonight is that of uh, poor regulatory design. So we see here a passage from Professor uh, Mitnick. Capture is said to occur if quite independently of the formal or conscious desires of either the regulators or the regulated parties. The basic structure of the reward system leads neither venal nor incompetent regulators inevitably to a community of interest with the regulated party. So we're not talking here about any kind of corruption or untoward actions on behalf of uh, the industry or the government responsible for regulating this industry. Uh, it's really about a misalignment of incentives for the regulators in this area to pursue the public interest in farm animal welfare. And by public interest um, in, this, in this field of, of scholarship, it's usually determined by the particular parliamentary or legislative mandate that underpins the regulation. So, for instance, in farm animal welfare, that may be uh, the the public interest in protecting farm animals from cruelty and the public interest in also seeing uh, the implementation of improved uh, farm animal welfare standards over, over the course of time. So if we have a look at the responsible uh, institutions, we see that in most jurisdictions it's the Department of Primary Industries or Agriculture that has the primary administrative responsibility. Um, in the ACT, the Northern Territory and the South Australia, we see that it's uh, a different department. However, the primary industries uh, representatives in those jurisdictions still play a very pivotal role in setting the policy agenda in those jurisdictions. And if we look briefly at the, the objectives and the responsibilities of these institutions, we see it's very much about promoting profitable or productive or competitive uh, primary industries. And they're just a, a few snapshots from mission statements and corporate documents from uh, departments of primary industries and agriculture in various states. Also, if we look at the, um, the national bodies in this area, we see the Department of uh, Agriculture at the Commonwealth level and also the COAG Standing Council on Primary Industries. Um, they have similar objectives as well. So again, references to profitable and uh, productive primary industries. And of, of course, that is a perfectly uh, legitimate um, objective. I mean, there's, there's no criticism of that objective on the part of departments of agriculture and primary industries. That indeed is in the public interest uh, to pursue those objectives. The real question is whether or not these same institutions should also have uh, responsibility for managing and promoting and protecting farm animal welfare. So uh, that is where the factual question of the relationship between animal welfare and productivity uh, comes into play. So, uh, that's what I'm going to address now. We see an enormous amount of simplification uh, in relation to this issue in our public debates and in, the, in our parliamentary debates. Much of this uh, simplification <coughs> is perpetuated by two key claims made by industry, being that 
Uh, productivity indicates good animal welfare. This is often expressed in the following form, that my animals are producing, therefore they must be happy. Uh, and that essentially at its heart is a scientific question. Uh, the second claim is that uh, producers have sufficient economic incentives to provide for good standards of animal welfare. And that uh, is often expressed in the following form, that it's in our commercial interest to look after our animals well. That question at its heart is really uh, an economic question. And we see that these uh, claims are often intertwined together to perform a, a logic as follows, that the producer uh, looks after the animal, puts the animal in a good state of welfare, a good state of welfare contributes to uh, better productivity in terms of uh, increasing the animal's ability to grow, or to produce body mass, to produce eggs, milk, etc. And in turn, that provides for better returns for the producer. So that's the, um, essentially the logic behind the claims. And it, and it certainly makes sense. It, it seems to be logical. Um, and that perhaps is part of the reason why these claims really do permeate our, our public and political debates on farm animal welfare matters. They seem to be uh, rolled out every time farm animal welfare matters are under debate and there's a suggestion that there should be stronger welfare regulation in this area. And uh, there's some further examples there of, of those claims. Um, but when we actually consider these claims uh, more carefully, we can see that they're actually uh, quite misleading in the sense that the only way they can be accurate is if a very narrow conception of animal welfare is adopted. Um, and I'm just going to address each claim very, very briefly. Uh, the first claim being that productivity and animal welfare um, uh, uh, essentially go hand in hand, or productivity is a good indicator of animal welfare. We see when we consult the relevant scientific literature that um, productivity or an animal's physical condition or physical performance is only one uh, aspect of the, the broader um, range of factors that need to be taken into account when assessing an animal's welfare. As Professor Donald Broom indicates here, an animal's physiological functioning, brain state, um, an animal's behaviour and even an animal's feelings uh, need to be taken into account when assessing uh, an animal's state of welfare. It's welfare cannot be assessed on physical condition or performance alone because it is possible to have a healthy animal in a physical sense that is not in a good state of welfare. So Professor Broom summarises this in the following passage, um, that there are many circumstances where behavioural or psychological coping mechanisms are activated indicating that welfare is poor but the animal's health remains good. <clears throat> These include situations where coping mechanisms are successful, such as when body temperature is maintained despite extreme ambient temperatures, uh, circumstances where failure to cope has consequences for psychological but not physical stability, uh, such as in the development of non-injurious pathological behaviours, uh, and also where detrimental effects on, upon physical stability are compensated for by management practices such as the routine use of antibiotics. So, in some, it can be shown that productivity is not always a good indicator of animal welfare. Now, if we go quickly on to the uh, next claim, uh, essentially that uh, producers have sufficient economic incentives to provide for good states of animal welfare, we see again when we consult the relevant literature in this area, um, and this time the economic literature on animal welfare and productivity, that that claim also is quite um, misleading. Uh, and this is a graph developed by agricultural economist uh, Professor John McInerney, uh, and it demonstrates a generalised relationship between animal welfare and productivity. And we can see on the graph that beyond a particular point in a production system, uh, increases in productivity result in decreases in animal welfare. So animal welfare is essentially uh, compromised or sacrificed in order to bring about better productivity gains. I, I don't have the time to go through what each point on that graph actually demonstrates, but uh, Professor McInery uh, provides a good explanation in this passage here, and I apologise for the text-heavy slide, but I think it's a very uh, important point that he's making here in relation to the uh, relationship between animal welfare and productivity. A simple logic of production economics allows one to postulate a generalised relationship between productivity, the productivity of livestock and their perceived welfare. This suggests there is complementarity at low levels of output with increases in production from better husbandry, so uh, nutrition, housing, disease control, etc., bringing about better welfare. 
However, ultimately and inev inevitably, a point is reached where further productivity increases will come at increasing welfare cost as intensity rises and husbandry techniques seek to exploit further the biological potential of the animal. Animal science and technology make such developments possible and commercial pressures cause them to be adopted. Since animal welfare is in the nature of a non-market good, it carries no evident price, so farmers inevitably focus on the animal's uh, productivity. Uh, which does provide commercial reward. Economic optimising theory demonstrates that market signals will tend to cause welfare standards to fall below the socially desirable norm. And we can certainly point to many practical examples of this relationship in practice. Uh, intensive forms of animal farming are a classic example. Uh, systems of farming that use uh, battery cages and sow stalls, for instance, are recognised for their severe impact on, on welfare. Uh, yet they may be uh, economically efficient means of production. Likewise, uh, live export is another classic example of the conflict between animal welfare and, uh, and commercial interests. And there are many other examples to point to. Um, indeed, we even alter the physical form of farm animals in order to make them fit our economically efficient means of production. Debeaking, tail docking, dehorning, mulesing, uh, castration, even the spaying of adult cattle is performed uh, on a routine basis uh, with, uh, in most cases, no form of pain relief provided. So it can be concluded that animal welfare and productivity is uh, most often in a state of conflict. Um, to suggest otherwise is simply to defy reality. Indeed, the very reason why we have uh, farm animal welfare laws is to manage this conflict in practice, uh, to set minimum standards of care and to prevent what may otherwise descend into completely unrestrained forms of, of exploitation. Although, judging by the, the images on that slide, you would be forgiven for thinking that um, that restraint is, is very uh, modest indeed, if, if non-existent. So, what are the effects of this factual conclusion on our current uh, regulatory and governance design for farm animal welfare? <clears throat> Essentially, it means that the responsible departments have conflicting responsibilities in promoting productive and profitable primary industries for farm animal welfare. It results in a heavily instrumental approach to animal welfare, where the value ascribed to welfare is wholly dependent upon its effects on productivity. So if there's a, a, a positive correlation with productivity, welfare is embraced and it's promoted within industry, within the government departments. If animal welfare has a negative correlation with productivity, which is most often the case, uh, animal welfare will be dismissed or severely compromised. Uh, ultimately, it means that pu the public interest in protecting farm animal welfare is routinely subordinated to the interests of commercial productivity. And as Professor uh, Biber has noted in other regulatory contexts, um, agencies will systematically underperform on secondary goals that conflict with the achievement of the agency's primary goals. I think that's a very uh, relevant finding for this, this field of regulation. So what are the effects on regulatory practice? Well, these are four areas that I'm looking at within my research, um, including industry domination of the standard setting processes for farm animal welfare, uh, industry control over the creation of animal welfare science, um, inadequate compliance monitoring and enforcement, and a significant disconnect between government policy on animal welfare and what occurs in practice. And these effects uh, line up very well with the recognised effects of regulatory capture in other regulatory contexts. So we see uh, in other contexts uh, a, a system that is deemed to be suffering from regulatory capture uh, may experience the effects of deficiencies in participatory democracy mechanisms, uh, a disproportionate industry influence in regulatory processes, uh, a failure to adequately uh, enforce regulations, and indeed even the regulator uh, adopting an advocacy role for industry, which is something we also see in the farm animal welfare context in Australia as well. So finally, reform options. There are a number of strategies that are proposed for addressing regulatory capture, uh, most of which uh, take the, um, the, the effect of greater checks and balances um, in regulatory processes, usually through parliamentary oversight mechanisms, uh, but also through enhancing the uh, participation of NGOs in regulatory processes. Ultimately, 
in order to design an effective response to a system that suffers from regulatory capture, uh, one must consider um, the, the, um, the issue on a case-by-case -case basis, of course, taking into account the uh, specific features of the regulatory environment, but also the specific features of the type of capture that has been identified. So in light of the primary mechanism of capture within this field, uh, my suggestion is certainly that uh, the primary reform that needs to take place is simply a separation of those completing uh, responsibilities. So taking farm animal welfare out of the departments of primary industries and agriculture at the national and the state-based level and placing it uh, within a separate government institution. And in light of the uh, complexity of animal welfare policy and regulation, uh, in light of the fact that animal welfare really cuts across so many different areas of government responsibility, and also in light of the growing community concern in animal welfare, I would certainly suggest that this should be accommodated through uh, the establishment of a new and dedicated statutory authority for animal welfare. Um, this will allow departments of primary industries and agriculture to get on with their job of promoting productive and profitable primary industries, uh, but also it will provide, importantly, a more objective, independent and balanced forum for the development of farm animal welfare law or animal welfare law more generally if all uh, areas of animal welfare are, inc are incorporated within the office. And this is certainly not pie in the sky type of suggestion. We, we see that uh, the Australian Labor Party has adopted within their formal policy platform uh, the establishment of an independent office of animal welfare at the Commonwealth level. Uh, we, we see that the Australian Greens are very supportive of the concept and also several independents at the national level. So I think while it might be, while you know, it's unlikely that we'll see the office established in this term of government, so long as the community interest and concern for animal welfare continues to grow, I think it's not a question of if we're going to see a more legitimate system for regulating animal welfare in Australia, I think it's simply a matter of when. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you.